night in a fancy take flight to the home of my childhood away to the days when each patriot's vision seemed bright ere I dream that those joys should decay when my heart was as light as the wild winds that blow down the far dike to each elm tree. Where we sported and played, neath each green leafy shade, on the banks of my The name of the city, Cork, is derived from the Gaelic word Cúrcóc, meaning bog or marsh. It is located in a valley in the lower reaches of the River Lee, an area formerly known as Cúrcóc Úr Vún, the Great Marsh of Munster. The district consisted of an archipelago of 12 low-lying islands and their dividing streams. The valley was contained by hills rising to a height of 500 feet to the north and some 300 to the south, covered in forests of oak, ash and elm, so thick it was said that a squirrel could travel from a croon to cork without touching the ground. About the year 600 AD, Fionn Baranefa, St. Finmar, established a monastery on the south bank of the river, in all probability on a limestone outcrop near the present suburb of Gilabi. The monastery became famous for its learning, attracting students not only from all over Ireland, but also from the continent of Europe. In the 9th century, its fame and its wealth attracted the attention of the marauding Vikings, and the monastery and the surrounding lands were attacked on 11 occasions. Some of these Viking raiders eventually settled down and were assimilated into the Gaelic way of life, becoming, as the saying goes, more Irish than the Irish themselves. Now, in the 12th century, the Normans invaded the country. In 1185, John, Lord of Ireland, granted the Kingdom of Cork to his Norman lords, the Barrys and the Ducogans, and they began to fortify an area on the islands in the centre of the valley, which became the city of Cork. The Normans constructed walls from the Southgate Bridge to the Northgate Bridge, say, as an axis, and in width along the line of the present Grand Parade and Corn Market Street to the east and Grattan Street and Hanover Street to the west. This was the limit of the city that remained almost intact until the beginning of the 18th century. Cork was never an Irish native city. It was in all but name a medieval English city surrounded by Irish people hostile to the inhabitants. The citizens, although successful in retaining possession, were subject at all times to great danger, frequently under threat, often isolated, cut off from commerce with the surrounding hinterland and its sources of food. Its lifeline was the river, whereby the citizens had access to the sea and could receive munitions and provisions from other Irish cities and from England in times of need. The 17th century was to be of immense significance in the history of the country and especially of Cork. The century began with the defeat of the northern princes, O'Neill and O'Donnell, and their flight into Spain. It continued with the murderous visitation of Cromwell in the 1640s. The Williamite Wars of the 1690s led to the exodus of the wild geese. For all practical purposes, the power of the old Irish and Norman dynasties was at an end. Now feeling secure, the citizens of Cork moved outside the walls and began the reclamation of the marshes to the east and to the west. They were also more tolerant of the native Irish, who, forbidden to live within the walls during previous centuries, were once again allowed entry. Key walls were built, and the streams which divided the islands were covered over, effectively transforming the original 12 islands into the single island that remains today. At the same time, new suburbs like Sunday's Well, Montanotti and Black Rock were developed. The old city walls were taken down, and gradually over the time period of 150 years, the city of Cork was transformed. 
Robert Gibbings, the writer and artist, once stated that Cork was the loveliest city in the world. Anyone who doesn't agree with me, he wrote, either wasn't born there or is prejudiced. As Edmund Spencer, the poet, described it, it is the city built of the native stone, limestone and red sandstone. Partly coloured like its people, red and white, stands Shandon Steeple. Shandon, Shandoon, the word means the old fort, a Church of Ireland establishment renowned for its famous pepper pot shaped spire, was constructed in the 18th century on the site of a very old fortification. Shandon Castle stood on this site and was previously the centre of English administration in the south of Ireland. The church is famous for its carillion of bells, made by Abel Rudd of Gloucester and immortalised by Father Sylvester Marney, who, writing under the pen name Father Prout, composed the song Bells of Shandon. Immediately adjacent to Shandon is Skiddy's Almshouse, the oldest inhabited building in the city. Constructed in the Italian style, it represents a series of charities endowed for the education of poor Protestant children and the care of destitute elderly Protestants. The area is now known as Bob and Jones, after the two lead statues now housed in Shandon, which stood at the entrance to the school. Mary Budd and William Heavey, made of lead and very heavy. The district surrounding Shannon is rich in character, containing, among other features, the Cork Butter Market premises, the loft and the Firkin Crane. The Butter Market was, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the premier butter market in the world. It was renowned for the consistent graded quality of the product. The brow of Shannon, formerly known as the Heights of Newgate, was to some extent a boundary between the faction fighters of Fair Lane and Blackpool. In the 18th century, the men of these districts met in ritual combat in pre-selected fields at the foot of Grana Broha. They were equipped with all manner of weapons. On one occasion, the black pool men being accused of introducing a new implement, a four-foot long stake with a sharp point and a kind of crook, so that if they missed with the jab, they connected with the crook on the return pull. A topical commentator described it as being related to a tomahawk used by the Red Indians of America. Serious injuries, were a regular result, and on occasions, deaths. The fights continued for days. The split in the Parnellite party appears to have revived the faction fighting. Fair Lane and Spring Lane were Molly Maguire's, our followers of John Redmond, while the residents of Great William O'Brien Street were supporters of William O'Brien. On the occasion of a Redmondite meeting in the city, the Fair Lane and Spring Lane bands proceeded homewards at about 11 o'clock in the evening, accompanied by a large force of Royal Irish Constabulary. The Fair Lane band house was in Shandon Street, but the band decided to march through Great William O'Brien Street, an act perceived by the RIC as inflammatory. The band and their followers were commanded to refrain from the march, but refused, and the RIC availed of the opportunity to attack all and sundry. They made generous use of their truncheons, and over 80 civilians were later attended to in the North Infirmary Hospital. Shandon Street was formerly known as Mallow Lane, and was the principal entrance to the city from the north side. It was a wealthy district, and for many years its traders, fearing an interruption of trade, successfully stopped the construction of St. Patrick's Bridge. The Northgate Bridge was for many centuries the limit to the size of the city to the north. Fortifications and a jail protected the city from the Irish and the corporation decreed that no houses were to be built within musket shot of the bridge in order to provide a clear field of fire to the defenders. The North Main Street was from earliest times until the 19th century the most important street in Cork. It contained the civic offices, the business establishments and some of the finest living quarters. Many lanes ran off the North Main Street, most of them no wider than a couple of feet. The widest street in the city was for many years Broad Lane, and contemporary accounts tell us that a man could touch both sides at the stretch of his arms. One of the oldest ecclesiastical sites in the city is that of St. Peter's Church, and churches have stood on this location since the 13th century. Castle Street intersects with the North Main Street. Originally, it was a waterway, and a water gate and two castles stood at its junction with Corn Market Street. These castles were incorporated into the city coat of arms, which depicts a ship sailing between them and the motto, Statio Bene Fide Carinis, which translated roughly from the Latin reads, a good and safe harbour for ships. When Henry Ireton, Cromwell's son-in-law, 
took Cork after a siege. He sailed up Castle Street, and some say that the gates were opened for him by people inside the walls. Christ Church on the South Main Street is the second oldest of the religious sites within the city walls. It was the corporation church in that the corporation held the official religious functions there. An old chapel on this site was badly damaged during the siege of 1690, and many of the citizens sought shelter within the church. It was decided to demolish the old church and erect a new building. The plans envisaged a great tower at the southwest corner of the building, but even during construction, the tower began to lean to one side. The height of the tower was reduced, but the inclination persisted, and as it was perceived as a danger to the public, it was taken down. It was this incident that gave rise to the comment, all to one side like Christchurch, signifying that a person was prejudiced. The poet, Edmund Spencer, author of The Fairy Queen, married Elizabeth Boyle, daughter of the Earl of Cork, in Christchurch. In 1809, Beamish and Crawford's was the largest brewery in the country, Guinness being in second place. There were other small industries associated with the breweries, in particular coopering and glass making. There were hundreds of coopers employed, and the wet coopers, that is the men who manufactured the beer barrels, were considered to be more skilled than the dry barrelers, the men who made the butter barrels and boxes. The glass manufactured in such factories as the Waterloo Glass Company was of excellent quality. The district immediately outside the Southgate Bridge may be the location of the oldest civil settlement of Cork. There may have been a native Irish settlement here in pre-Norse times. There was a small castle and a jail at this site, and the bodies of executed native rebels were exposed on the gateway, a gruesome warning to all. The Church of Ireland Cathedral of St. Finbar, probably the finest architectural edifice in the city, towers over the South Gate Bridge. It is situated on a site in proximity to where the earliest monastery was located. At the Siege of Cork in 1690, the besieging Williamite forces climbed the tower and from their elevated position poured volleys of shot into the city and wrought many casualties among the defenders. In retaliation, the besieged attacked the church with cannon and years later, a cannonball was found embedded in the tower. It is on display inside the present building. In 1735, the medieval church was taken down and replaced. However, in the middle of the 19th century, it was decided to erect a more worthy cathedral, and the foundation stone was laid in 1865. John Burgess was the architect, and he donated the statue of the golden angel that stands on the roof. Tradition has it that three days before the end of the world, the golden angel will sound the trumpet, giving the citizens advance warning of doomsday. Some difficulty was experienced in the building of the church. The first contractor became insolvent. St. Finbar's is richly decorated in carved stonework, and the front, or west entrance in particular, is of outstanding merit. The stone used was Ballina Slow Limestone, and the bulk of the cost of the work was borne by Mr. Sharman Crawford. Under the pulpit, a plaque commemorates the memory of Elizabeth Alworth, the only woman ever to have been enrolled into the Masonic Order. This unique incident took place when the lady was in residence at Donnerail Court, and hidden in an alcove, she witnessed a meeting of the order. In order to preserve the secrets of the Masonic rites, Elizabeth Aldworth was accepted into membership. The organ, built originally by Hill of London, was extensively rebuilt by McGahey of Warren's Place, Cork. It is of unusual construction, being contained in a 14-foot deep pit and the console is 60 feet distant from the pipes. It is thought to be the only example of such construction in the world. The district known as St. Mary's of the Isle lies to the north and in the shadow of St. Finbar's. The first house of the friars preachers or Dominicans was established in 1290. It was then outside the walled city, but the friars enjoyed the privilege of having free access to the city. The monastery was suppressed at the Reformation, but Perkin Warbeck, the bogus pretender to the English crown, is reputed to have stayed in the monastery. Mayor Walters, who supported Warbeck, was taken to England and hanged at Tyburn. There is a tradition that at the time of the Reformation, the sacred vessels of the monastery were buried in the vicinity, but they had never been found. 
There is to this day a link with education in that the Crawford College of Art is built in St. Mary's of the Isle. The college premises incorporate some of the buildings of Sir John Arnott's brewery that stood on this location. Turkey Street was one of the old watercourses of the city, and the first steam-powered boat, the city of Cork, sailed from the street. A Turkey Street businessman, Mr. O'Brien, was the first person in the city to light his premises with gas. This street leads to the Grand Parade, known in Irish as Shroyd and Chapel Wee, the street of the Yellow Horse, and it takes its name from an equestrian statue to one of the Georges. The Grand Parade was another of the city watercourses, and a bridge stood at the junction with Turkey Street. The Queen's Old Castle, now a shopping complex at the northern end of the Grand Parade, was originally the site of a castle, the King's Old Castle. The Queen's Old Castle stood at the other side of Castle Street. It is both of these castles that are represented on the city coat of arms. Later, the castle became a courthouse, and many famous trials, the outstanding one being that of the Donnerail Conspiracy, were conducted there. The great Daniel O'Connell, the Liberator, appeared for the defence and succeeded in having some of the accused acquitted. The South Mall was originally constructed in the 18th century as a promenade so that the merchants and their families could walk in the evenings and take the air. A key wall was erected and a great deal of trade was conducted before the water was reclaimed and made into a street in the early days of the 19th century. Soon, private banks were operating. The most famous was Latouche, which was amalgamated into the Munster Bank, which in turn became the Munster and Leinster Bank, and which is now the Allied Irish Bank. The founding promoters of the bank included James Murphy of brewing fame and Charles Stuart Parnell. The external walls of the present building are of cork limestone. Inside, there's a wealth of decorative stone, cork red, Connemara green, and variegated Kilkenny black, English and Italian marbles. The outstanding features are the series of pillars that support the roof. Six of these pillars were originally intended for the organ loft of Old St. Paul's in London. They were not used, and the architect acquired them for the Munster and Leinster Bank. It then transpired that two more pillars were acquired, but the marble quarries in Spezia in Italy were found to have been closed. The owners were prevailed upon to reopen the quarries and provide the two additional pillars. In the absence of reliable information, it is extremely difficult to portray how people lived in 18th century Cork. There was no public sewerage system and no public water supply. Refuse of all kinds, the waste after dinner, sewerage, offal from the meat factories, and night waste was indiscriminately dumped in the streets. The corporation was obliged to erect contraptions called pig traps to capture the pigs that were in the streets. Many of what we now take as streets were, of course, watercourses, and deaths from drowning were a commonplace occurrence. <laughs> the North Siders, in particular, made regular incursions into the North Main Street, driving a bull before them, torturing the animal to the consternation of the authorities and a danger to the public. A public gallows was erected in the North Main Street, and criminals were hanged there, the occasion being regarded almost as a public entertainment, and huge crowds attended. The crimes for which people could be hanged were of an extraordinarily minor nature. At the beginning of the 19th century, Cork enjoyed a period of great prosperity, a consequence of Britain's imperial wars. The merchants of Cork decided to erect an establishment wherein visiting merchants could conduct business in comfort. They prevailed upon the British government to enact legislation, the peculiarly titled the Butter Wayhouse Act, imposing taxes on goods entering and leaving the harbor. From the proceeds, a tavern was erected. Later, it was extended to provide accommodation, and in time, this establishment became the present Imperial Clarence Hotel. The buildings adjacent to and to the west of the Imperial Hotel were constructed of material imported from Holland as ships ballast. The merchant ships leaving Cork with provisions for the British Army engaged on the continent chose to bring back those yellow bricks as ballast. Incidentally, steps leading up to the front door are still a reminder that the houses once fronted onto the riverside. Near the Imperial Hotel stands the facade of what remains of the Cork and County Club, which was the location of one of the most daring exploits of the War of Independence. A British officer, Major Smith, declared that all Republican suspects should be shot on sight. Later, when visiting Cork, he stayed in the club. 
A couple of young men entered the premises, asked to be introduced to the Major, and having verified his identity, shot him dead and calmly walked out, never to be apprehended. Other buildings of note on the South Mall include the beautifully sculpted Allied Irish banks, formerly the Provincial Bank and the Classical Savings Bank. The General Post Office on Oliver Plunker Street was at one time a theatre and was the scene of a bizarre incident. A gentleman, a tailor called Redmond, was executed by public hanging at the gallows near Green Street. A visitor to the city, an actor, performed some form of artificial respiration and succeeded in reviving Redmond. The tailor proceeded to celebrate his resurrection and that evening attended at the theatre to thank the actor. Most of the audience had earlier attended the hanging and recognising the victim panicked and caused injuries to many patrons. Cork, as we all know, was derived from the Gaelic Kirkuk, meaning marsh or swampy place. Those people who've experienced city centre floods at high tide will vouch for the accuracy of this description, I'll tell you. Gronabohar comes from Gronamrochir, the friar's garden or grove. Boreen Manor means the monk's little road from the Irish Bohereen the Manor. Not all place names are as easy to explain as these. A good example of this is afforded by Buxton Hill off Sunday's Well. It is not, as you might suppose, called after a Mr. or a Ms. or a Mrs. Buxton. Originally, it was named Corrigan on Ia, meaning the deer's little rock, or if you will, the Buck's stone. In the course of time, of course, this became Buxton and led to the invention of a non-existent Mr. Buxton. And happily, the nameplate at the bottom of the hill has restored the original meaning, reminding us of these long-gone deer whose cousins now roam the glorious wildlife park at Fota. I have sought to discover a haven of rest where the sun sings by night in the land of the west. I have slept with the red man beneath leafy boughs, and the wild roaring prairies be spangled with flowers. I have fired to the north where the hardy pines grow, midst the wolf and the bear and the bleak winter snows. I have traveled our climates, but none could I see, like the green hills of Cork and my home by the lee. Beautiful city, charming and pretty. Beautiful city, my home by the lee. I have slumbered neat palm groves by clear running streams, but the wild groves of Blarney came haunting my dreams. I have listened to bells on the soft summer wind, but the sweet bells of Shandon were dear to my mind. I have danced with gay dancers, my sorrow to hide, but no maiden I found like the one by my side. There is naught in the land of the slave or the free. Like the green hills of Cork and my home by the lee. Beautiful city, charming and pretty. Beautiful city, my home by the lee. Beautiful city, charming and pretty. Beautiful city, my home by the lee. 
St. Patrick Street, or Hannah, is now the principal street in the city. However, it was until the early part of the 19th century a watercourse, and known as Colville, and the Long Key. It has been for almost 200 years the focal point of the city. There is but one example of the days when the water ran past the houses, the steps leading over the doorway of Le Chateau Hostelry. The leases of the houses include clauses granting the owners mooring rights to the river. The street was much damaged during the War of Independence and the black and tans rioted and burned much of the city. The northern end of Patrick Street, from Marlborough Street to St. Patrick's Bridge, and many other individual buildings were destroyed. The tans also destroyed the city hall. The Victoria Hotel, which was at the junction of Patrick Street and Cook Street, was the scene of many civic events. National figures, particularly politicians, addressing the crowds from the windows of the hotel. It was from the Victoria Hotel that Parnell delivered his speeches, including his famous exhortation, let no man set bounds to the march of a nation. No man has a right to say this far and no further, and we have never attempted to fix the ne plus ultra to the progress of Ireland's nationhood, and we never shall the words of which are engraved on the Parnell Monument in Dublin. It was from here also that victorious Cork All-Ireland teams were introduced to their supporters on the Monday evening following their return from Dublin. But Parnell was but one of the nation's politicians who spoke in St. Patrick Street. Cosgrave, Dillon, Costello, De Valera and others down to the present era contributed. Patrick Street was also the location where many of the city's characters performed. Jeremiah McCarthy, known as the Rancher, pushed a wheelbarrow around the city, selling firewood, every now and then stopping to entertain the citizens with his comments on the affairs of the city fathers and demonstrating by falling on the ground and crawling along on his hands and knees just how he had performed in the war, never bothering to explain which war he had in mind. On one occasion, an American tourist listening to the Rancher and failing to understand a word spoken inquired for a translation from the gentleman standing alongside. He was perplexed when he failed to understand a word spoken. The translator happened to be another well-known character, Andrew Egan, locally known and loved as Andy Gore, who unfortunately had a speech defect. It was usual for Andy to dispense small coins to children in the expectation that the parents, and later the children when grown up, would grandly recompense him. There was a character from the Bandon Road who regularly declared to all in Sunday that he was a hurler, a ball player, and a man who could puck a ball from here over Queen's College. A denizen of Blackpool, when inebriated, informed the public that he feared no man, woman, or child. I died once before for Ireland, and I'm not afraid to die again. Several of these characters presented themselves for election at the local hustings. The rancher tried but failed the test, and as a result of this failure, he brought down his curse on the supporters of Glen Rover's Herning Club, whose support he had sought and indeed expected. Eight county championships won, but never again. Up to bars and, hmm, to Glen. <laughs> Jerry Bruton, a gentle little man who entertained the crowds, who in those days queued for admission to the cinemas with his own rendition of Let's All Go Down the Marina, was another who unsuccessfully braved the hustings, leaving it to the great Klondike to carry the torch to victory. Klondike, or the Diker, as he was sometimes known, was a well-known character who frequented the centre of the city. His name was Jeremiah Healy, and he claimed to be an invalid from the British Army. He was small and dapper, dressed in a bowler hat, swallowtail coat, striped pants and spats. When saluted by even the smallest boy, he doffed his hat, bowed and replied, Good morning, or indeed, good afternoon, sir. He had a preference to be addressed as Dr. Healy in deference to the doctorate conferred by the students during a university rag week. The ceremony was performed on top of one of the old air raid shelters in the cold cave. It was a colorful affair with buckets of red liquid signifying the doctorate to be in medicine. The university students prevailed upon Klondike to stand in the municipal elections of 1942. He was a one issue candidate the provision of a lady's toilet in the city center. His favorite drostum was a small parapet accessible only by ladder over Cook's travel agency in Patrick Street. Klondike thus installed was marooned when the ladder was withdrawn and on many occasions suffered agony as the students were wont to dose his drinking water with generous amounts of Epsom salts. Klondike had a particular an uncharacteristic antipathy for the then city manager, the well-known Philip Monaghan, who attended many of Klondike's meetings. Klondike was always circumspect in his reference to the city manager, preferring to refer to him as 
a certain city manager of this city. Klondike always returned, however, to his election topic. The nations of the world, he reminded his audience, are spending millions of pounds and money on arsenals. All I want is one urinal. To everybody's amazement, Klondike was elected, and to the further amazement of the populace at large, the ladies' toilet was duly built on Lavitt's Quay. Klondike approached the city manager and pointing out as having been responsible for the construction of the toilet, he felt it only proper that his contribution be recognized. He suggested that his portrait be hung in the foyer of the toilet. Philip Monaghan declined, but promised to investigate feasibility of having Klondike's portrait printed on the toilet paper. It is also of interest to note that the play playing at the Opera House the week that the toilet was opened was Louis Dalton's famous comedy, They Got What They Wanted. William Thompson of Patrick Street, one of the most extraordinary of Cork people, was born in 1785. He was extremely original and prescient in his thinking and was an early advocate of the cooperative movement, establishing and financing a cooperative in West Cork. He was a member of the Chartist movement and an early socialist whose writings predated and greatly influenced the work of Karl Marx. Thompson was an advocate of women's rights and wrote a book on the subject. Even in death, he was controversial, stipulating in his will that he was not to be buried with Christian, Jewish, or Muslim funeral rites. A French phrenologist who admired Thompson succeeded in acquiring his skull and used it at lectures to demonstrate his theories. The AIB premises at the corner of St. Peter and Paul's Place and Patrick Street was the property of a Mr. Bolster, a bookseller and publisher in the 19th century. Bolster was known to be dilatory in the payment of fees and was known as the Cork Screw. Charles Dickens, during a lecture tour in Cork, visited Bolster's shop. Alerted to the visit of so distinguished a guest, Bolster arranged for a young and unknown artist to be secluded in the rear of the shop, from which position he executed a portrait of Dickens. The following day, the completed drawing was exhibited publicly, and Dickens, on viewing it, expressed his admiration. The young artist was Daniel MacLeese, and this was the beginning of an illustrious career. Foley's statue at the statue, the part of Patrick Street adjoining the bridge, was commissioned to commemorate Father Matthew, the Apostle of Temperance. Although he did not establish the abstinence movement, that distinction lying with three other persons, Father Matthew was the inspiration of an incredible worldwide movement. St. Patrick's Bridge was the object of much controversy. The proposal to build the bridge and thereby open up the northeastern suburbs for development was strongly opposed and delayed by the vested interests of the Shannon Street and Blackpool traders who held a monopoly on trade entering and leaving the city in the north side. Eventually, the corporation built the bridge, but on two separate occasions it was destroyed by flood until eventually the present stone bridge was erected. In 1847, a group of Cork business people who had visited the Crystal Exhibition decided to copy London's example and hold a great exhibition in Cork. The Great Cork National Exhibition was the first of its kind in the country, predating Dublin by a year. The site was adjacent to the City Hall in Albert Quay, with the Corn Exchange premises as the principal venue. Other pavilions were constructed to accommodate the exhibits, and at the conclusion of the exhibition, one of the wooden structures was dismantled, removed, and re-erected on the site of the present Opera House. Subsequently, this structure was replaced by a building. Much beloved of Cork people, it was destroyed by fire in December 1955. The present building was eventually constructed. The red brick building adjacent to the Opera House is the Crawford Gallery of Art. A portion of the building fronting Academy Street was originally the Custom House built in 1724, but when the new offices of the Cork Harbour Commissioners was built on Laps Quay, these premises were handed over to the Royal Cork Institution in 1832. In the middle of the 19th century, the British government provided the funds for the establishment of a school of design, and in 1884, Mr. Sharman Crawford of the Brewing family agreed to defray the costs of an extension. In the space of a hundred years, from 1750 to the 1850s, Cork produced a considerable number of talented people. There was Sylvester Marnie, otherwise known as Father Prout, a brilliant controversialist, author and composer of the song, The Bells of Shandon. 
Robert Bell, the prolific author, Jeremiah J. Callanan, the poet, the folklorist Crofton Croker, Edward Hinks, the philologist, William McGinn, who edited the famous Blackwoods magazine and was co-founder of Fraser's magazine, Ethel Voynich, the daughter of the mathematician George Boole, was the author of the acclaimed book The Gadfly, a seminal work in modern fiction in that the hero was a revolutionary figure. This book was translated into numerous languages, including Russian and Chinese, and has the distinction of having sold more copies than any other book by an Irish author. In more recent times, writers like Daniel Corkery, Frank O'Connor, Shona Foylon, and Shona Reardoin have achieved much literary success, while the musician Shona Reardoin was a great influence in the development of music in the country. Cork has produced also a considerable number of eminent artists, painters, sculptors, John Hogan, although born in Tallow, was brought to the city as a child and received his early training in Cork before being sent to Rome to continue his studies. He became one of the foremost sculptors in Italy before returning to Ireland and Britain where he executed many outstanding works of art. In addition to the statue of Crawford now in the gallery, his dying Christ is on the main altar in St Finbar's South Church. Daniel MacLeese was from Shear Street and in his time was regarded in Britain as the foremost portrait painter of his day. Samuel Ford, a contemporary of MacLeese, executed many works, among them a crucifixion for Skibbereen Church, but he died at an early age. The irascible James Barry won for himself a brilliant reputation and indeed his election as Professor of Painting at the Royal Academy in London. His temperament, however, led him into difficulties and he died a recluse. In more recent times, Seamus Murphy was a consummate sculptor and Robert Gibbings, in addition to his writings, was a most brilliant woodblock carver. The Church of St. Peter and Paul is on the site of the old Carey's Lane Church, built in 1786. In the 1860s, the parish priest undertook the task of replacing the old church with a new edifice. He was a remarkable man with the most extraordinary career already behind him. John Murphy was the son of wealthy parents. As a boy, he signed on as a midshipman with the British East India Company, went to China, and then served for some time with the Hudson Bay Company in America. During a second period with the Hudson Bay Company, he abandoned his work and went to live with the Red Indian tribe, where he became a chief and was given the name Kish Nagisha, which translated means Black Eagle. He eventually returned to Cork, went to Rome where he was ordained a priest and was sent to Liverpool. However, he was summoned back to Cork to serve during the famine times. He commissioned the younger Poujain to design the church and it is resplendent for the use of native stone and the quality of the wood carving. John Murphy was also responsible for the establishment of the Mercy Hospital, which under the management of the Mercy nuns was the first hospital to be totally in control of a religious order. In the 18th century, the industrialization of Cork demanded a strong labor force. The population began to increase and all the evils associated with the introduction of industry began to manifest itself. In particular, the exploitation of child labor. The need for education as provided by the civic authorities was ignored. Nano Nagel came from a strong influential family being related to John Philpott Curran and Father Matthew. She saw at first hand the work of the Ursuline Order in France and prevailed upon the Catholic Bishop of Cork to permit them to establish a school. She purchased the site in Douglas Street from her own resources. The school flourished and Nano Nagel, although not professed, saw to the recruitment of teachers. However, within a short time, she disagreed with the practices of the Ursulines in providing educational facilities for the rich. She severed her connections with the Order and established a new order, the Presentation Sisters. In time, the order spread all over the world. The Christian Brothers were established in Waterford in the beginning of the 19th century, and within a matter of years, opened a school for boys in the north side of the city, and undertook the same type of work as Nano Nagel was doing for the girls. A split also occurred in this order, with one faction establishing the Presentation Brothers. The university in Cork dates from 1848. The buildings were designed by Sir Thomas Dean and Macaulay declared that they would have done credit to Oxford. In 1908, the name was changed from Queen's College to University College Cork. The burning of the courthouse on Washington Street on Good Friday, 1891, was a great tragedy in that most of the old records pertaining to the city were destroyed. 
The authorities move at commendable speed in commissioning the architect Arthur Hill to design a new building, stipulating that the original front wall and portico left standing after the fire be incorporated into the design. The present building was completed in 1895 and includes some fine examples of Cork, Connemara and Kilkenny marbles. Grattan Street to the rear of the courthouse was outside the old walled city and was one of the first districts reclaimed from the marsh and developed after the Mulliamite Wars. The building used as a medical dispensary was previously a meeting house of the Quakers. One of the society's most renowned members was William Penn, founder of the state of Pennsylvania in America. The Society of Friends were introduced into Cork about the year 1650 by two lady members, Elizabeth Fletcher and Elizabeth Smith, and the first building was erected on this site in 1677. One member of the society, Edmund Martin, was one of the three people responsible for the founding of the temperance movement. The Mercy Hospital was originally built as the Mansion House, being the official residence of the mayor. It was designed and erected by Davies Ducat in 1767. The upkeep proved to be a continuing drain on the finances of the corporation, and in the middle of the 18th century, it was sold to a Vincentian priest, Father O'Sullivan, who established a school there. Subsequently, the ownership was transferred to the Mercy Order of Nuns, who established the Mercy Hospital. Sir Henry kissed behind a bush, Sir Henry kissed a Quaker, and if he did the dotty thing, I'm sure he did not. or that bit of doggerel was composed in the 1820s to commemorate one of the most celebrated court cases. Sir Henry Brown Hayes was a son of Attuel Hayes, known as Atty, a wealthy merchant in Cork and the owner of a celebrated goat that lived to such a great age that the phrase, as old as Atty Hayes, his old goat, was coined. The family home was Vernon Mount, now in the ownership of the Munster Motorcycle and Car Club, a strange building decorated with frescoes and a magnificent stone staircase. Henry Brown Hayes was a city sheriff at the age of 19 and a freeman at 20 years of age. He was a member of the notorious Young Bucks Society. He was an officer in the disreputable South Cork Militia and was knighted for his exertions during the 98 Rebellion. A widower when about 40 years of age, his fortunes were at a low ebb and he decided to marry into money. He chose as his bride a young lady, Mary Pike, the heiress to the fortunes of a banking family. Mary Pike, a Quaker, appears to have rejected Brown Hayes' advances, whereby he initiated the most extraordinary series of actions. He arranged for the abduction of Mary Pike from the home of Penrose Cooper in Tivoli, had her brought by coast to Frankfield House, and there had some form of marriage ceremony performed by a bogus minister. Mary Pike refused to be intimidated, and eventually she was released. She had the authorities issue a warrant and offered a reward for the arrest of Brown Hayes. The trial caused a sensation, and the redoubtable John Philpott Curran acted for the prosecution. The citizens who congregated in great numbers for the trial encouraged Curran, may you win the day, to which Curran replied, if I do, you will lose your night. And win he did, the sentence being that of hanging. However, it was commuted to banishment for life to New South Wales. Brown Hayes lived in some luxury in a suburb of Sydney. He imported two boatloads of earth from Ireland in the belief that as St. Patrick had banished reptiles from Ireland, the soil would keep the Australian reptiles from his property. Eventually, he was pardoned by the governor of the penal colony, none other than the famous Captain Bly of the Bounty Mutiny. Brown Hayes returned to Cork, and he is buried in Christchurch on the South Main Street. The story would be of some amusement were it not for the effect the abduction had on Mary Pike. That young lady suffered some kind of breakdown and was eventually committed to an institution. The Church of Christ the King, Turner's Cross, is one of the finest architectural works in the city. It was designed by the American architect Barry Byrne of Chicago, and it was consecrated by the Reverend Daniel Call and Bishop of Cork on the 25th of October, 1931. The design was originally entered for a competition and apparently placed second. It was the subject of much controversy at the time, being the first major building to be constructed of mass concrete, thereby drawing down the wrath of the stonemasons. The nearby cemetery of St. Joseph's is of particular interest in being the first post-Reformation Catholic graveyard to have been opened. Previously, permission for burial on consecrated ground had to be sought from the Protestant authorities. 
the site of the cemetery was originally owned by the Royal Cork Institution. It acquired this ground and established a botanical gardens, the intention being to help educate farmers and gardeners. Later, the property was acquired by Father Matthew. Cork is a city that has seen its good days and its bad days. It was once the third city of the British Empire. It has seen its great labor-intensive industries closed and the traffic in the harbor dwindled to a fraction of its former greatness. It is a city that believed, perhaps does still, in the old aphorism, Limerick was, Dublin is, and Cork will be the greatest city of the three. The distinguished Cork actor and writer, Neil Tobin, may have summed up the character of his native place best when he penned the poem. Cork is also James Cook, Timothy Jim, Flurry Brook, Cork is Lavis Key, Manar, Daly's Bridge, and Andy Gore, Cork is Stacia, Hannah Pidge, Mullet on the Patrick's Bridge, Knuckles steaming on a dish, Catholics who stock all for fish, railway engines on the street, close to where two rivers meet. Cock is murky, foggy, funny, scintillating, sad, and sunny. Where young Shani, Gunk, and Chazer asked the barber for a bazaar. Not a thing, however, strangely or disturbed the Goldie Angel. Cock is lofty, sprawling, grown, toffee apples and brown dawn. Cock is goiter, gawk, and oil, the butterer, the four faced liar. Cock is silence, one and all, order for a noble call. Tongues and tails and fibers wag, out in Killeen's when there's a drag. And good old drummer and Kyolan sniff the trail they laid at dawn. Crosser, mikes, and pipers' merries. Planks of luscious ripe blackberries. Caucus tadpoles and tar knees, battle board and sweet rashes. Caucus like as not is what'll quickly be whipped off the bottle till Paddy be dished out in dollars for the men from the metrollops. Caucus maybe, I agree, not what it's cracked up to be. But brother, even if it's not, it is still the best of what we've got. Where we sported and played, it is greenly fishing on the banks of my own lovely lake. Oh, how oft do my thoughts in their fancy take flight to the home of my childhood away. The wild winds that blow down the far dike to each fallen tree. Where we sported and played, meet each green leafy shade on the banks of my own lovely lea. Where we sported. This has been a Paul Albert production in association with Noel DC Cars, main Peugeot dealer, Commons Road, Cork.